Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. I thought it would be good to do another podcast from the grower's perspective and some of the successes and challenges associated with running a commercial facility. My guest this week is Michael Wilson. Mike is the owner and head cultivator of Maine Craft Cannabis, a cannabis cultivation company licensed under Maine's medical cannabis program. Maine Craft Cannabis grows organically in living soil beds, and I met Mike when he reached out in 2018 regarding consulting and dialing in the program in his facility. We've stayed in touch ever since, sharing ideas and test results as we continue to learn. Before joining the cannabis industry, Mike had a career in mechanical engineering, designing industrial centrifuges and x-ray machines. If you want to learn more, you can check out Maine Craft Cannabis at maincraftcannabis.com or on Instagram at maine underscore craft underscore cannabis. Now on to the show. Hey, Michael, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Dad. Absolutely. So you started Maine Craft Cannabis in 2018, and uh, I've known you for, I think, since 2018 or 2019. But I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about your sort of the, the methodologies and timeline of your evolution as a grower um, going to a commercial scale here with Minecraft Cannabis. Can you kind of take me through that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. So my wife and I started the business in, uh, in the commercial facility right in the beginning of 2018. Um, and, you know, kind of from the beginning, I think we were always wanting to be organic and we were sort of in, um, you know, smaller pots at the time and, um, we were using cloth pots and, you know, we ended up kind of like leaning on bottled nutrients here and there. And, you know, if, if we got the organic amendments to run, right, it was sort of a threading the needle sort of operation. And, you know, we were having some issues really getting the, the quality we wanted. Um, and that's when I kind of came across your podcast and reached out to you and that kind of began the relationship. And, you know, you've really guided me towards um, the larger soil volumes and all that, which I had my resistance to. Um, you know, and since then, we've sort of just gone down this journey and things have really started clicking pretty well. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit on that process of sort of where you where you started in the facility in terms of you, know, you were in these pots? Um, can you talk a little about how you were growing and then I, I can, you know, I mean, I can talk a little about our conversations and where that started, but, um, I'd love to hear it from your perspective. For sure. Yeah. Um, so we were just, you know, I think when we first started, we were just, you know, mixing our own soil. Um, and you know, we weren't really getting repeatable results at that point. And, you know, we ended up with a lot of like week five problems. Basically we could, you know, get through veg pretty well. Um, and then by the time we got to flower, a lot of times we just had um, deficiencies popping up. And, you know, we saw some of that in, in veg once in a while, but it was a lot more manageable. Um, and, you know, at the time, so I was testing all sorts of, you know, different amendments and stuff. Um, and then with the mixing, because we're in Maine, so it's really hard to mix soil um, in the winter at my location because you can't really do it indoors where we are. Um, so I had this, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of soil testing. I got a bunch of different soils and tested them out and, um, you know, found one that I thought that was really great. We sort of standardized on that. Things went pretty well. And, um, you know, their, their internal recipe sort of changed and it really created, um, a lot of problems. And basically we had way too much nitrogen is what happened. Um, and then, I think that's probably when I started reaching out to you. I was listening to your podcast, which um, I'll interject here. I actually really wanted to say thank you for doing the podcast because, you know, you have a lot of really amazing people come on your podcast and I'm really flattered and like um, a little beside myself to be on it because I think that um, most of the people that come on have really in-depth knowledge on specific subjects and kind of my background is, is more somebody who's just, you know, figured out the living soil thing in one specific application. So, um, 
I just really, you know, thank you for doing the podcast. And I've connected with a lot of people you've had on, which have been really great resources for me. Um, so anyway, so I reached out to you and, you know, basically everybody I knew, I was like just whoever would talk to me at that point, like everybody, you know, is having problems. You just call people who might be able to help you. Um, and that's when, you know, I made the decision of like, okay, I'm going to try to learn how to manage my own soil. Um, and we started moving up to larger pots and, you know, by the time we got to about 20 gallon pots, that's when things were, I just noticed the mending is a lot easier. Um, you know, it's, it's the inconsistencies sort of go away and it's not like everything was perfect. Um, but it was, you, you, it was, we weren't threading the needle anymore to get a crop to finish the way we wanted to. Um, and that's when, you know, we did our first, you know, test bed. Um, we, it was about a yard of soil that we put in and we did a test and we did a side by side. Um, and it was, night and day and i was really nervous about going to larger to these these huge beds about how to move them around and if we we're going to move them around and um it really just made things a lot simpler um and you know more manageable and more consistent for us yeah well i, I first off thanks for the nice words and i appreciate you coming on the podcast um, i think it's important to offer a grower's experience uh from time to time and I think your story was really unique. Um, I do. I actually think I met you when you were still mixing your own soil because I remember you were top dressing with a lot of um, different amendments, um, and you were using oh, guano yeah. at the time. And um, you were like trying to go off of what the plant was doing, and then you would add uh, the amendment. So you were always playing catch up in these pots. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, in the guano, I, I remember that one specifically because. Um, that was one of our least reliable amendments. It was like, you know, you can put the same amount in and that's when I started really to um, just notice like, okay, this is a, this is a product you're buying and it's got these uh, numbers on the front of the, the, but it's an organic product and it's going to break down. And the guano was a lot of times it was really hot. It would just, you know, we just overdo it. So um, yeah, I remember that we, we definitely talked about the guano. I think you steered me away from it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you just, you, I remember you had a lot of variables going on. So between the small Fine. pots and the the various amendments and then trying to diagnose a deficiency, it can be, it can be really challenging. Um, and I know we, I think I talked to you into slightly larger pots. I, I tried to talk you into beds and you were like, there's just no way in this <laughs> facility. You were adamant that it was impossible. Um, yeah. But you, when you went to the larger pots, the plants got better. Um, not perfect, like you For said, sure. but I, I think that solved some of it. And then I remember, um, I think I actually may have mentioned this soil company to you because I just knowing where you were and um, was hoping that that would be a good solution for you. And then you, you w describe what you were seeing when you, when we talk about the nitrogen thing, because I didn't notice it until I saw the soil test, but you had a buddy come in there that was really good at looking at plants um, from yeah, a yeah, hydro yeah. background. I had, I had a friend. Yep. I had a friend who'd, uh, you know, been growing for a real long time and he basically just casually mentioned this nitrogen toxicity that I had going on. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and it was just like really dark curled leaves, especially on, you know, ones that don't get as much light. And, um, you know, that sort of brought up the, the idea of that. And then, um, you know, we got some soil analysis back and the nitrates were just like through the roof. Um, and that actually you know, I hadn't realized it, but I my, I wasn't having as much success in veg. I was getting these like kind of really leafy, bally plants that just weren't, they were just weren't growing the same and the, the root zones weren't doing what they normally do. Um, so I think it actually was hurting me more in veg than I realized. Um, he noticed it in the flower room. So then we just looked at the soil analysis. And I remember I shot it too, because I didn't know anything about looking at a soil analysis at the time. And then uh, you were the one who, who brought that up. And then... Um, yeah. So at that point I was like, okay, so if I buy a product, it's just like, I, I can't really rely on anything, the quality control of another organization. And that's when I really made the decision to really learn how to, um, you know, manage my soil. And I, you know, I read like the Steve Solomon book, the intelligent gardener, I probably listened to that podcast like five or six times. Um, and that's what sort of engaged me in really trying to, be basically the idea that I was going after with reusing the soil is one, I mean, it's the economics and the sustainability of it, but also it's, 
if you can manage your own soil, you're in control of your own destiny. You're not kind of hoping that the thing that you've been buying all along hasn't changed. And it's and organics. That's a that's a big big thing. I mean, you know, organic products just aren't as consistent. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a really good point. Uh, I, I found. I've heard this story a couple times, not just with soil, but with bottled nutrients too, with, with companies changing the formulation and growers oh, not really? being aware of it and then having issues potentially. Um, but then there can also be mixing issues with, with batches and things like that too. So that's, that's absolutely a, a legitimate concern. Right. Um, now you got into the soil testing. You really dove with both feet into that. Um, I think your engineering <laughs> brain kicked in and, um, gave you some quantifiable numbers to allow you to really look at what was going on in your room and have some numbers to support it. Um, and, and this is, I think, a really interesting aspect of this because you got really heavy into soil testing and now you've kind of um, backed away a little bit from that. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, for sure. The, uh, the Steve Solomon book, The Intelligent Gardener, like he goes through um, when I read that book, he basically goes through how to do all your own calculations for, you know, if you're going to use these amendments, how to break down what the, you know, numbers on the bags mean and, and be able to, you know, do your amendments to hit your target. Um, and I, yeah, like the engineering brain definitely was like, okay, this, like, I love math. Like, let's do this whole thing. So I got this whole spreadsheet going and um, definitely went all in on the, you know, the math of it all. Um and then, you know, I wouldn't say quickly, but I think over time I really started to see that the soil analysis results didn't always make sense. Um, and then through that process, I kind of um, talked with, um, so I've, I've always used Logan Labs, and uh, I talked with Susan in the lab there and kind of really was trying to understand, like, okay, so what happens, like, after I take a soil uh, sample and send it to you, like, you know, because I was trying to duplicate just, you know, basic things like pH and EC if I, before I send it to them and then see that I'm getting the same result from there. And I'm getting a lot of variance um, just on basically, you know, soluble salts. Just it was I, w I would get numbers that were orders of magnitude different um, when I tested that same, you know, sample that I took and then sent it to them. And then the. Um, and I just learned more about how they do their testing and, you know, where some of the variances are. And, you know, the, the sample size was one of the things I remember Susan telling me about. And the fact that, like, those soil analysis were never really meant for um, indoor soil as media. They're meant for field soils, which are mostly mineral soils. And, you know, she's like, I can't even do a, um, I have to, like, your, your material, it doesn't sift through the sieve. It just clogs it up because there's so much organic matter. You know, like we have 25% organic matter, which is, that doesn't really exist in most field soils as far as I know. Um, so they can't even really do the test exactly the same way. And then it's such a small sample, which in, again, in field soils isn't going to matter. It's just much more homogenous. But with, um, you know, indoor soils, if you get a clump of perlite or a clump of whoever knows what, like a, you know, a little sulfur ball or whatever, you're just going to get more scatter in your results. Um, <clears throat> so then I started doing even more testing which got quite expensive, I would do multiple. So I kind of have averages to look at. Um, and then I've just kind of backed away from that quite a bit. And I still do soil testing every round on every bed, but I'm really looking at more of that as a, a pattern. And I can know what the soil result looks like uh, from the previous run and what I added for amendments. And then if something doesn't look right, I have a pretty good idea now. So I use them as a guide now. Um, but I don't really react to any one individual result I ever get anymore. Um, but I still do quite a bit of the analysis. I just mix it in with um, intuition and in what I'm seeing a lot more than I used to. Because um, if you if you took it with all of like 100% accuracy, like every bed, every round would be getting totally different amendments. And that's just not what's actually going on. Yeah, so the sample size, it, it does. So a couple of things I want to highlight um, that I've learned, not just from you, but from people like Bryant at Soul Doctor Consulting and Bill McKibben over at Logan and talking to mm -hmm. the lab, because you were the one that actually brought to my attention the, how small, I think it was like a half a teaspoon or something that they're using on the M3 test. Is that right? Whatever. I think it was two milliliters or something like that. I can't remember now, but it was, 
I remember like asking her like, is that you know, like it's not two tea- teaspoons because I was sending them like a baggie full of soil, like a sandwich bag. Yeah. And then I'm like, that's what's going into the analysis. So if you took ten different samples from that same bag, you'd get ten different results. And she's like, a hundred percent. Yeah. And then in you know, Bill and Susan both were like, you know, really steering towards a saturated taste. Um, so now I do both. But anyway, sorry to interrupt you. No, that's great. And and this, so just to remind people, um, I actually heard this analogy uh, in the in a soil and mineral group through Erica Reinheimer recently, um, a link to an article that was talking about the differences between the Malik 3, which is the standard test, and the uh, saturated paste. So the, the Malik 3 is a acid extraction. I think it's a 2.5 pH acid that they use. Um, so it's a really strong acid in that it will tell you everything right. that's in the soil. That's sort of your savings account. But it doesn't really tell you what's available right now. And they look at that. Like that's where the saturated paste comes in, which they were calling right. sort of your checking account. And you know, for some people that may be a useful analogy. Um, one other pointer with a saturated paste is you can send in your own water sample with Logan too, and that will give you a more accurate result as to what's being released to your plant based off of your water, not the deionized water that they use as a default if you don't right. send in water. So a couple of pointers there. I still lean fairly heavily on the standard, but most agronomists who I respect and people that I know lean more towards the saturated paste. So I think that's more my, um, <laughs> my lack of education on it. Um, but I can look pretty quickly at a test and at least, at least figure out like what the most likely limiting factor of growth is. And that's right. what I think is most useful about these tests. Um, and, and I don't know that, you know, you necessarily need to test every bed. What one thing that Brian and I have talked about offline is that, um, when we see a grower that tests every bed and then they also do a sample where they take all the beds and mix them together, assuming all the plants were, you know, the, the, the treatments across the beds were standardized and the plants are all relatively doing well. You don't have like this one problem bed. Um, the results end up being within a, you know, a standard deviation, a range where, uh, you don't, you know, you could save that money because the tests do get very expensive, like you mentioned. So, yeah. Have you found yeah, that that sort yeah. of mirrors what you're you were seeing on your end too, or? Yeah, yeah, very much actually. So, um, yeah, I shouldn't really say that I test every bed, every run anymore. So, um, in in the you know in, in my older room, the the beds are still one yard each, um, and I used to test every bed, every round. And now what I do is I do them in groups of three. So there's basically six, um, you know volumes of soil that I'm amending because I do, you know, I sort of do like A-B testing if I'm going to like, um, you know, try out a different amendment or a different um, target on something. So a lot of times I have like a cultivar that I'm running, you know, four beds in the same room. So I'll do like, you know, different, I'll have like two be a control and then, um, you know, two of those beds will be control beds. And then I'll do one with like, you know, let's say I'm going to try adding nitrogen at different points or something. One will be like, some nitrogen here and then another one might be more. So I'll sort of use them um, to do tests against each other. So I do, I kind of have six pods in there is the way I think of it in that room. And then in, in the newer room, um, those beds are three yards each. And then I just take one sample from each one of those beds. Well, we take three samples and then do like a composite, mix it up. So there's only one. Um, yeah. So in, in something like 20 yards of soil per room, I'm taking like six tests, okay. um, which does save, quite a bit of money um and i actually I, I look at the saturated paste um as more actionable than the uh the standard test nowadays sort of like what um you were saying and i think the calcium is the big one on the standard that just throws everything out of whack because um, mm-hmm. it, it, it tells you you have this incredibly high amount of calcium you don't need to amend anything and then i'll look at the ppms on the um on the saturated paste and you know, this was one of the first times that I was like, okay, this saturated paste is super important because I was seeing that, um, you know, it's having 50 ppm of calcium when the standard was showing insanely high numbers. Um, so now I kind of disregard the calcium on the standard and really watch it more on the saturated paste. And I could track that with results. And, um, you know, Justin, your friend Justin McGill, um, you know, he's he was a really good person to talk about that as well. And he shared some of his data. Um, and I've been able to, you know, really identify that pattern of making sure you have enough calcium on the saturated paste. And that's what sort of drove me that direction. And now, um, 
you know, I took Bryant's course too. The um, his uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it's, it's like that cannabis course on his um, on his website, mm-hmm. and that really connected a ton of dots for me. And he does, you know, talk about how to weigh the two, um, which was kind of what I was already doing, and it really it connected a lot of um, it connected a lot of things for me, and, and really made a lot of sense. So, you know, that was that was really helpful for me. I don't use all of his exact targets, but I think that the methodology of, of a lot of that was really helpful. Yeah, and I will say one one thing to mention is that Steve Solomon's book was really designed for people growing vegetables in actual soil, and it wasn't designed around maximizing yield. It was designed around uh, increasing nutrient density. So he gets much more involved with trace trace minerals, and his targets are not optimal, I would say, for cannabis, and I think he would admit that too that that wasn't the initial goal with his with his writing so uh bryant's targets are i think much better for cannabis um but again you're going to want to make adjustments for your own facility and just to just to plug bryant's class i've taken it too it's it is excellent um if you want to learn how to do this stuff yourself i think that's the best resource online and there is a, a coupon code for uh if you put in Kiss Organics in, in on the website, you'll save I think 100 bucks off the test or 150. I can't remember, but or off the course. So uh, shameless plug there. I'll throw that in there. Um, <laughs> Brian's Brian's Wish a great I had guy. I that coupon code when I took it. <laughs> <laughs> you should have. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's a good it's a good course and it's it's interactive too. So um, yeah, if people want to learn more, they can definitely check that out. So yeah, just yeah. wanted to mention that. Um, so in terms of the, in terms of the testing now, uh, I I think you bring up a good point. So you find that the tests give you good actionable information, but they don't tell the whole story. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the way you said it kind of sums it up pretty well. I mean, I, I definitely do all of the testing because, um, I feel like with no testing, I'm just kind of flying blind because I do see that the, you know, like I'm not amending the same thing every round. And I I do see the need like to change the amendments every round. So if I didn't do um, any testing, I would feel like I would have really, you know, a a pretty vague idea how to do the next round's amendment and it would probably be fine. But successively, I think that it would be tougher to course correct um, without really ever seeing what those changes are. So you know, I don't look at the individuals. I, I just more look at the trajectory and the patterns that I see. Um, and, you know, I do trust that. I, I think at one point I was really like, okay, these tests are just too erratic and I can't really make good judgments on them. Um, and now I've kind of come around the other way where, you know, like I have a history of the testing in, 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 in the facility and in, in the beds. And I know in general um, where I want to be and if things are you know, like sometimes I'll just get an insanely ridiculous number on, on something and I just disregard it completely. It's just an outlier, which means nothing. But if I see, you know, on all six or seven tests from the same room, they're like, okay, I have plenty of nitrogen right now. I'm not going <laughs> to amend any nitrogen mm-hmm. or, or um, you know, it doesn't really ever happen with potassium. I can't seem to add enough potassium. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, that information is still it's critical to what I do every round. But I just I'm looking more at it as a trend or a pattern um, of what I'm seeing in the room and analyze. I think that does that answer your question. It's kind of vague, but yeah, I find the two levers that we pull the most on with our soils and tests, um, and this is a lot reflected with Justin's test too, is usually nitrates and calcium. So we'll see sometimes we'll see too much calcium over time uh, build up. Uh, but again, we have to watch that availability on the saturated paste. But then nitrates right. is the other one that for some reason will show up. And I think some of that is just in these in these large beds, you have all these worm populations that explode over time and then break down additional organic matter and are releasing uh, minerals. And so we kind of have to keep an eye on that because I've had runs with Justin where we don't amend at all or we just add a little bit of egg sulfur or something very, very minor, maybe a little bit of potassium sulfate, but have to cut back completely just because we see nitrates um, showing up yeah. really high, even though they didn't add a lot of nitrogen the round before. So, yep. 
It's kind of interesting. Yeah, one of the things that I, one of the things that I think I've, um, you know, started to hone in on, and and it, it solidified for me during um, when I was taking the course with uh, with Bryant was the compost because that wasn't really something that I had an analysis on. It wasn't something that I was really factoring in much. So when you're adding compost every round, um, it can take a really long time for that compost to, you know, release its nitrogen. And, you know, it's like, I'm really speaking right outside my lane here, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, so he's talking about the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, I think like anything like over 20, it can actually be um, a nitrogen sink, if I remember what he said correctly. Um, and I was looking at some of the compost I was using and it was 22, 23, um, carbon to nitrogen. Um, and so I think in, in my case, what might've been happening is I was adding compost and it was actually a sink for a little while. And then, you know, months later, it was this wave of nitrogen that was coming out possibly from the compost. And, you know, Justin and I actually had the same sort of nitrogen surge uh, at the same time when he was cutting back his amendments for uh, for nitrate I was too and it was also during the summer so I have a it's a little bit far-fetched but I'm going to do it anyway is this summer um, I'm going to send in a refrigerated sample of soil and then one you know in the heat of summer because one of my theories is that possibly the nitrates is changing just during the course of um, it being shipped and then getting tested a week later and I don't I don't know what your opinion on that is but I'm 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 going to test it either way because I'm just curious. It was both mm. of us had this nitrogen surge in the summer. Um, but I also did see, you know, high nitrogen in my plants and I didn't amend and I didn't run out of nitrogen. So there was a bunch of nitrogen in my soil. Yeah. So when I, what we look for too is to just for people that are testing is not total nitrogen. That's not a very useful number, but you want to look at nitrates and ammonium. And then right. uh, that ammonium number should be very low. Like, below one um a lot of times it doesn't even register on our tests um mm -hmm. because if that number is high what that's telling us is that there's there's still organic matter it's still hot that's going to break down and release into nitrates um and it gets a little tricky that tells me that you used probably unfinished compost most likely um into the bed mm -hmm. whereas that nitrate number is fairly is, is a fairly useful number and in, in determining how much nitrogen your plant's going to have available that cycle and you can have target we have targets around that for depending on what week you're in um mm -hmm. but i haven't thought about it in terms of the temperature of that soil if the microbiology due to the heat and travel in the in the mail could somehow affect that, that that's interesting i hadn't thought of that variable there's always other yeah, variables don't... you don't consider and then <laughs> have yeah to come i remember back i to talked it. to um I talked to Susan Logan about it and she was like, maybe she seems kind of skeptical, but she was like, it's possible. Like, it's not going to, it's not going to stay exactly the same, you know? Sure. So the question is how much does it vary? So I'm like, okay, once, once we get some hot weather again, I'm going to send in, you know, a pack that's a little Ziploc that's nice and refrigerated and kind of not doing anything and then send in another one through the regular mail. So. Yeah. I will say though, like, like you, what we found with Justin was there still was sufficient nitrogen next cycle. So the test was yeah. relatively accurate um, in that regard. Um, yeah. But, I pulled back on my compost amendments quite a bit. So I, I just don't add as much compost and I end up adding more um, other nitrogen amendments. And, you know, that seems to be working well for me right now. It's a, something I started doing like maybe about a year ago. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't think you necessarily have to add compost every cycle. Um, mm. So that's that's a that's a valid point too, because you're also going to be bringing in fungus gnats potentially every time you bring in compost or any you soil that bring has. Definitely bring in fungus gnats every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's one thing about compost that's a little bit challenging, or any soil that has a compost fraction, it's it's relatively unavoidable. Um, mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit. I want to. Um, I kind of want to go back to this idea of all the variables that you consider when evaluating your plants beyond just soil testing, because I know for us, like when we get a soil test from someone, I have a series of questions that I need to, that I feel like I need to get information on to make an accurate recommendation. Like I am not comfortable doing it off of just a test alone. Cause like when I started, you know, it was like you, it was with that Solomon's book. And that was where I really started learning about mineral balancing and Albrecht and, and started going down that whole 
uh, that whole path. Um, and I was just using the Grow Abundant calculator uh, that Erica Reinheimer put together. It's a it's a good resource if like if you just want a quick and easy test. Like I use it for uh, my garden beds if I don't feel like doing math. Um, you can just plug the numbers right in. The subscription is very affordable, and it'll spit out something that's based off of uh, their book, The Intelligent Gardener. She was a she was a co-author on that. But if it's for my cannabis plants, and we're talking about really maximizing fertility, um, there's a lot more variable there than just uh, a soil test. Like I know I want to know what the CO2 levels are they're running in the in the facility and what the light levels are a canopy and maybe a little bit about what type of genetics and how long are you vegging and flowering and what size are your containers and how are you watering um there's you know there's a whole list of things there and and i want to see photos of the plants how did your plants finish are you happy with where they finished and the yields and all of those things go into the analysis it's not just you can look at a number on a test and then make a recommendation yeah totally agree um, so are, is there any other things that you really look at too, when you're, when you're going to re-amend the soil, you know, take me through sort of, I know I, I just stole your, your thunder a little bit on that by naming a whole bunch, but <laughs> I was going to say you, you covered a lot there. Were there um, other ones that I didn't you know, miss off the top of my head? It is. Yeah. You know, one of the things which has really been really fun and interesting and eye opening coming from an engineering background into this is just the amount of things that um, the amount of variables that go into the process. And, you know, it's like, like I want to bust out a spreadsheet that has all of those variables and then I can do like, you know, data regression or something and try to figure out how to optimize all of those parameters. And it's just too many. Um, So I don't really have like a, a set process on that. I think it's like one of those things where you're just, you're watching every run as it's going um, cause even like light spectrum, I, I did, um, a, in the, in my new room, I did a bunch of different light types. And, uh, you know, one of them is this, um, it's a dragon alpha from science. And I really love those lights. And I had all these ideas on how I was going to start messing with the spectrum at different times, um, during the growth cycle and do all this testing to, you know, look at the, you know, red and blue and all of that. And, I've sort of backed off on it because there's so many other variables um, going on in there that I, I kind of, I'm not at a point where I can like, okay, really get into that and consider that as a, as a, an AB test at all. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I just didn't answer your question. I think I answered your question by saying that there's a lot of gut feel and I don't really have um, a process other than just seeing how that run finished. And I'm kind of always trying something a little bit new every run trying to zig my zigzag my way to optimization but it's there's too many things there's too many things so what you're calling your gut is really um your subconscious giving you uh feedback based off of experience because you've done you know you've been doing this for how your gut's definitely gotten smarter i guess is what i'm getting at um how, yeah, i mean how many like cycles I have, in I have are like, you now? i have my ideas on when i see something going on with a leaf pattern of what I think that means. And, you know, I just, I, I really try to avoid making any solid conclusions like, okay, I know that this little yellowing on the, on the serrations of the leaves is telling me that I have a potassium deficiency, which is what I believe. But I also am like, okay, that's probably what I think that is. So I'm like taking in all that information. Um, and, you know, and just seeing what the, the, the pattern of growth, like if I don't see, that first few weeks, that explosion, like I normally do, you know, then I'm thinking about what my nitrogen was probably doing earlier on in, um, you know, in the flower room. And then, so I might change the way I look at the, um, the nitrogen on the next round or something like that. Cause that's the one that for me, I trust the least on the, um, on the analysis. I almost, you know, I just look at it and be like, okay, am I good here to not amend anything right now? But even if it's, higher than I would like it to be, I'm still planning to add something a week or two later into flower because I know it's going to drop down. Um, or at least that's my mental model. But yeah, I what, don't know. I mean, I think you just. Yeah, well, what are you adding then uh, just for listeners when, when you are. I mean, I add a lot of your, 
Yeah, I add a lot of your um, your nutrient pack, and then um, I have a lot of specific amendments. Um, you know, I add a lot of gypsum, potassium sulfate. I have a few different um, nitrogen specific amendments, just you know, like alfalfa meal, sometimes some feather meal, um, fish bone meal. I, I use a lot of that. Um, Calfos. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know. I think I think I probably have you know, probably about 10 or 12 different things that I use regularly. Um, right now I'm doing a whole bunch of investigation on micronutrients, which we've already discussed, but, um, you know, I don't really have a lot of that stuff on hand in general, besides maybe manganese. I actually do want to talk to you about trace minerals. That was a question I was saving because, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because in my experience, you know, like if you go the intelligent gardener route, you're adding, trace minerals uh, pretty much every cycle to get a balance. Whereas my experience with cannabis and looking at a lot of tests, I now won't touch trace minerals for at least a few cycles um, of testing. Cause I want to, so th for me, the first thing I look at is pH, um, how available mm -hmm. the nutrients gonna be. And then from there, you know, on the standard, I'll, like uh, I'll throw out some numbers. Like I don't really worry too much about the organic matter percentage on the standard. Um, Bryant has a really good explanation on that. Uh, the CEC on the standard is a very useful tool with potting soils. And, and again, Bryant has a good right. Instagram video explaining why. Um, but when we talk about uh, trace minerals, I, I find that uh, the only time I really look at it is if something looks really, really high or it's just virtually non-existent. I mean, if there's a little bit in there on showing up on the test, then I, I usually don't worry about mm -hmm. it and just focus on my macros. But what, I know you got into fiddling there for a little while. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely, that's what I do. Yeah, um, take me yeah, through I it. Did some, I did some, yep. Um, so, you know, in, in, those, in that room with the pods, as I was describing, I sort of did a, you know, three pods were a control where I didn't do any micronutrients. And then two pods were sort of, um, you know, one regime of micronutrients and one pod was another one. And then, so it was basically half the room was, you know, status quo, no micronutrient additions. Um, and then the other one, I think I added, then I ended up adding um, copper, zinc, manganese. I added a lot of manganese, um, boron, and um, uh, maybe one other one I can't remember right now. Um, and I do think that that side of the room has benefited from it more than the other side, but I don't see any there's no game changers in there. The plants just, they seem to be a little less um, water stressed. I see, I, I just feel like they can drink a little easier. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see like any accelerated growth, but, you know, when I first put the plants in, there's one cultivar I have, which just hates me, um, in veg, it's uh, Strawberry Sour Larry, which is, it always finishes great, but it, I, I have trouble with it in veg every round. It, it is the first to tell me if it's pissed off. Um, and that plant, when I put it into the beds that have the micronutrients, and I, I've done some micronutrient testing in veg too, but um, more sporadically, when I when I bring that cultivar into that room and I put it in the in the beds that have had those micronutrient amendments, um, and I don't know like which one it's reacting to or just the, all of them combined, that plant reacts more quickly in the beds that have the micronutrients. So it's more like fine tuning in general is is what I think I'm seeing more than, okay, there's this magic micronutrient that has been missing that has, you know, um, changed my world or anything. Where I'm more interested in doing it is in, um, in veg for propagation for taking moms. Um, because I do think that there's, you know, propagating organically is, it's always been the thing I'm the worst at. Um, you know, they tend to stay in the trays a little bit longer. They don't root as quickly. Um, I'm not using a rooting gel like a, a plant growth regulator. And, you know, that mother plant nutrition, the health of that mother plant is just that much more critical when you're growing organically um, and doing propagation organically. So I'm really targeting that in, in, uh, in veg for propagation purposes and just getting the healthiest cuttings I can to, to root more quickly. Because I do think that potentially with forming calluses, like I've done some experiments on callus formation and, you know, on some of them, like the strawberry sour Larry, I'm not getting a callus sometimes for 10 or 11 days. So no wonder I'm not getting explosive root growth. Um, you know, so I think that it's 
one of my theories is that that whatever it's missing that's really you know it's it's upset about in veg is probably the same thing that's really preventing it from being able to callus up and um and even though like when you take that cutting they look great they look healthy um because the, the moms in veg have bigger pots um but as you know after a week and a half in a tray you can really start to see that it's not doing as well and you know if you check for calluses you know they just they're not forming at the pace i'd like them to and i guess my theory is on the micronutrient is more for propagation than for flower although i do see I feel like I see benefits in flower. Okay, okay. And uh, how many cycles in are you now uh, with some of your rooms? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's like, yes. you know, five cycles a year in a room. So um, in that room, I think I'm probably with your soil like three and a half years or something. Oh, wow. So um, maybe 15 to 20 range, something like that. Okay, okay. Awesome. Um, have you had ups and downs there in terms of, I mean, how much does your yield fluctuate cycle to cycle? Not much. It's actually really consistent right now. Um, some of my older cultivars are kind of trending down, just the vigor is decreasing. Um, the quality is still doing great, but the, the yield on some of my older genetics is kind of declining. Um, that's one of the other reasons I want to look at the micronutrients and propagation is you know, there's probably been some rounds where the cuttings haven't come off of a mom that's as healthy as I would like, and that sort of just tends to accumulate, I think. Um, so the, some of my yields have tracked down a little bit, but then on the newer cultivars that I bring in, you know, they're just smashing again. So I don't think it's a soil thing. I think it's just, a, you know, having genetics that have been propagated for four years, you know. But yeah. the, the yields are, are pretty predictable. I, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to get for yield in, in each room and on each cultivar at this point. Yeah. Now, one thing we haven't talked about as a variable uh, when reamending soils or evaluating plants is, is pest pressure. Uh, are you mm -hmm. comfortable touching on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, we, we did that video um, on Instagram with the aphid. That was our um, pest experience really that was really traumatic i mean we've dealt with a few pests over time but we had the cannabis aphid um yeah so what was your specific question <laughs> oh i i guess i was just thinking about things that will influence um plant health and yields when we're talking about re-amending if i'm re-amending and i know that mm -hmm. you know the you know the person is battling you know cannabis aphid or spider mites or thrips or broad mites brood aphids whatever whatever it may be, that can have an impact on overall yields and plant health, uh, growth, yeah. depending on how they're managing it. Um, and so that also should be factored in when I talk about reamending the soil. If they're seeing something on the plant, well, it may not be from soil, it may not be a soil fertility issue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, since the cannabis aphid thing, we haven't really had any, you know, pest pressure issues. Um, I put out a lot of beneficial these days. Um, I like to think of my facility as, you know, just loaded with starving insects, ready to eat anything that might find its way in. Um, saw some thrips a little while ago. Um, you know, Suzanne's been a really great resource for me. I sent them off to her. You know, we did, um, oh, geez, I can't remember the name of it. We did a release of, um, of one of the predatory things for thrips. And, um, and I've been using cucumeris for years now. And... Um, we just we saw some thrips on a few plants for a little while and they just sort of went away so we haven't had to um you know deal with them but the uh the fungus net issue has been um you know especially in propagation with the younger plants the fungus net issue has been um you know consistent for us you know growing organically so we use a ton of you know nematodes and um there's been a couple of times where I think the fungus gnat population in the in the younger plants has kind of stunted some of them, mm -hmm. um, but not really from like an amendment standpoint because I'm not amending that soil. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. S SF nematodes are great for dealing with fungus gnats, and I think they're they're just something that people should have as a maintenance routine. Um, yep. Just to, just yep. to stay ahead of things, it's much easier to to get ahead of it than try and battle it. So. Yeah, I learned that one the hard way when I had that uh, cannabis aphid. After that, I just loaded up on beneficials, and, um, you know, we've been lucky since then, I guess. Uh, 
Well, having good practices to keep things out of your facility is always, uh, I think, the best, the best thing you can do. Too. Yep. Yep. You just got to learn it the hard way. Because before that, I was like, oh, man, these end officials are a bunch of money. I'm just going to make sure that I don't bring in any genetics. And, um, you know, I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed, basically. <laughs> uh, so no more, no more of that for us. Well, you're in a building, too, where there's other grows, right? Or in an area where right. there's mm-hmm. a little more risk? Yep, for sure. I mean, you, we're in a building with other growers. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's a high probability of, you know, many bugs flying around the building and flying in my door. But also, you know, like our grow isn't super sophisticated. We, you know, we have doors that come into rooms and then doors go, go into other rooms. So in the spring, it's entirely possible that we're going to have an aphid find its way in an open door, you know, either on a person coming from the car into the building or just finding its way in because our plants smell nice or whatever, you know. So as... And as someone who, you know, started this facility and as, you know, sort of evolved to where you are now, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've experienced along the way? And this doesn't necessarily have to be cultivation um, related in terms of an answer. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think finding good information is probably the biggest challenge. Um, you know, it's like, good information on cannabis is tough to find and it's in a, and it's in a growing field, you know, a lot of this has been, you know, behind closed doors for a long time. So you're just calling somebody, you know, or, you know, finding some stuff online that you can go from and God knows how accurate that is. Um, So historically it's been next to impossible to have great information. And now there's a lot more coming out. Um, And, you know, through your podcast is one of the sources, honestly, for me. Um, But yeah, I mean, just just being able to get really good information and, you know, like like Googling, I mean, I can't, you know, Googling leaf deficiencies. You, you take a picture of your leaf and you're sitting there with your iPhone, you know, trying to compare this to a, a, a picture you find online. And it's, you know, that's it's next to impossible. So then you're trying to call somebody who might have had a similar issue. Um, so that's been that's been a process is just getting good information, you know, Um I think another one is um, that cannabis aphid. I mean, that was like a, that was a hard time. Um, you know, I wasn't sure if we were going to make it through that. Cause at that time, like you're, you know, you're kind of living crop to crop. I mean, all of us growers know it's like everyone thinks we're raking in the money, but you know, there's a lot of money going through the business with power and rent and trying to pay employees. And, you know, when you have a couple of crops that, aren't going to go well. I mean, it's not, it's not long before you're not paying your bills. Um, so that was a, that was a pretty scary time because if we hadn't gotten rid of that thing, you know, one of my solutions was to, cause I was, I mean, I was probably overreactive at the time. I was, you know, really just terrified of this bug that supposedly wasn't on the East coast. I didn't know anybody else out here that had it. And I remember Justin talking about it and he really scared the crap out of me. Um, and then I, I remember I sent when I first got a picture of it, I think I sent it to you um because i don't think i knew suzanne at the time um actually that's when i met suzanne <laughs> through, through the cannabis safe experience um and then justin and justin's reply was get ready to go to war man <laughs> um <laughs> so so let's let's just touch so, on it i don't i don't want to get too into sure. into pest advice just because i we have suzanne who's really the the expert on that and yeah really I the just, foremost the expert the on time. that and we do but um, I know Justin through, you know, some of his processes is able to, I, we're never allowed to say eradicate because out of respect for Suzanne, that's not a word that we can use when we're talking about pests, but we can, they have not spotted another aphid in their facility in, in over a year or two now. Um, it sounds like you're in a similar boat. What, what really like put the nail in the coffin for them um, in, in your facility? So for us, it like? was the heat treatment. We, we, we cooked the place. Um, which was a, a, a risky move and it was a dangerous move, but it was, we only had, um, you know, we only had it in a few spots and I was just really scared of this population exploding really quickly. And I, you know, I wasn't really sure what to do. And I remember reading about how fast it can replicate. And I, I found one, I put it in a baggie and I went back the next day and there were six in there um, in a 24 hour period. And I was like, Holy crap. 
so, you know, that's when I basically panicked, you know, like I, (laughs) (laughs) Suzanne wouldn't say that this was like a smart thing to do. Um, And I try not to tell other people like, you know, this is what you should do because I think a lot of people probably can't do it. But, um, you know, I heated the rooms, you know, aphids don't like heat. And I, I cooked the rooms up to 120 degrees for two hours. Um, and you know, I lost some plants and veg for sure. And I was in there watering them the whole time. And thank God we had large soil volume. Cause if you didn't have, if I was in pots, like the, the root zone temperature would, you'd kill the plants. Um, you know, when we did kill some plants in the bedroom, but that's what I did and it worked and we never saw another aphid again. I did that. And then I did a, a huge release of the, the wasp, the Colmani and Irvi Ir- or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, lace wings all over the place. So we just went full bore on that and then did a huge, so we did the knockdown talking with Suzanne that the, the heat treatment was to do a knockdown. Um, and then the, you know, the beneficial release after that, and I never saw another aphid and that was, I don't know, a couple of years ago now. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to, I want to change direction. There's a couple questions that we, there's a couple things we haven't talked about that I think people might find interesting, especially if they start following you on Instagram. Um, so two things. One, I want to talk first about your blue mat experience. Um, cause okay. I, I think that's interesting and I think we should add contrarian views to, you know, our experiences because <laughs> As, as everyone knows, we're big fans of blue mats. I, we use them in quite a few commercial facilities. Uh, Justin McGill, who's a good friend of mine, and, and Mike, Michael knows him too, um, he uses them very successfully. So you bought a bunch of blue mats. Tell me about your experiences. Yeah, when I first bought them, um, you know, I, I bought a few to try them out and had really great results. Some of the best results I've ever had is on blue mats, to be fully transparent. Um, and just as we've tried to put them out on a larger scale, and I, I don't have a large facility, you know, we have two flower rooms, each one's, you know, one's like 400 square feet, and the other one's 500 square feet of canopy. Um, trying to get the consistency that I want out of the blue mats, I just haven't been able to accomplish it. Um, you know, like my philosophically, one of the things I don't love about the blue mats is you don't really know if you're underwatering until you see a, an unhappy plant wilting um which if that happens late in flower that's a big deal um or you have you know runoff coming out of your beds and then you go to make the adjustment on the um on the blue mats and they're just really sensitive so by the time you have a bed that's running off it's probably going to keep dripping for another day and like we don't have really great water mitigation i put some like you know system underneath the bed to kind of corral the water it doesn't really work that well so in my older room where the, when the beds run off, it just makes a mess. Um, and also I don't like the idea of losing the nutrients, but the, um, yeah, I mean, you know, they tend to, if you get like any air in there at all, even if you filled them up and did everything, you set them properly. Sometimes you get a little bit of air in one and they just don't, you know, they don't work. If there's any air in there, it's basically a cushion on it. So they don't have the ability to, you know, the, the tension doesn't work its way through to the actual mechanism that pinches the little hose. Um, so we just haven't been able to get it to be as consistent on scale. And some of that might just be through having multiple people in the facility. If you're doing a a default or a cleanup on your leaves, if you bump the thing, even if you don't twist the knob, if the, if the blue mat itself gets bumped and it breaks contact with the soil, it's going to think the soil's dry because it's got air. Um, so we had a, you know, a few experiences like that with runoff. Um, and because my facility isn't that big, um, we just hand water and, you know, I don't think that's our forever solution. I don't, you know, I'm not saying everybody should hand water larger facilities because it's a, it's a pain in the butt, but for right now, it, it, that seems to be working more consistently for us than the blue mats were. Yeah. So I, you know, uh, I've, I've heard this a couple of times. Uh, it's a little more rare, but the, you know, it is for some people, it just, it doesn't work quite the way they want it to. Um, I will say I've worked with some fairly large facilities that are pulling it off, um, but the concerns around the air inside the sensor or the air mm-hmm. around coming in contact with the sensor in the in the soil itself. So like if there's a big chunk of pumice or perlite right next to that sensor, it could cause it to um, just over over water, like you right. mentioned. So yep. those are those are definite concerns. Um, 
I think if I was in a larger facility, I'd probably be a little bit more incentivized to try to figure it out um, because the, the labor savings would be more significant, basically. Um, and I like I think if we kept going at it, we would eventually figure it out. But, um, you know, I don't know. I just we haven't had we haven't adopted it. We, we tried it a few times. And, and when they're working, they're great. But there was too many times where it's. You know, the nail in the coffin was we had um, one of them clogged from the inside, basically. So the hose looked like it was wicking water. And there was, you know, there was a, it was, we were using the, um, what's that white hose stuff? The, um, the blue soak I want to say drip tape. Yeah. The it's, blue soak, it's yeah. It's essentially soaker hose, yeah. Yeah. So it looked like it was watering. Um, and it really wasn't. And we didn't notice it. And it was like, you know, week six. And we had two beds that, you know, just tailed off hard and finished really early. And then that's when we realized that they just weren't getting any water. How um, can you explain that? Because the way they look like the water is they actually perspire through the hose itself. So you can see the droplets coming out of the soaker hose, right? Yeah, I think, well, the, so the hose was, I mean, you know, after you use them a few times, they get pretty, you know, dirty. Uh -huh. So you don't really see a droplet anymore. You more just see a film on the hose. Um, and I think in this case, there was a biofilm that had sort of formed from the inside. So there was some water coming out of them and the, and the, the actual thing was pressurized. So it was like, okay, that when you walk by, you think it's watering and the soil looks a little dry, but you can see a little wetness on the, on the, um, on the hose itself. And you can, you know, it looks like it's watering. Um, and, yeah. so, and that was a new one. We hadn't seen that one before. And I think that one is, extremely rare I, I i've talked to a few people about it and they, they were like yeah we're, that's not that's not a common thing um and it only happened on you know two of the beds that run and that was the only time i ever saw it but yeah i've never seen that but i i guess i could see where that could happen we always uh clean in between cycles the we clean the blue mat and and the soaker hose to make sure that you know it's ready to go for the next cycle but the other thing, too, right. that we typically have people doing is going around with a moisture meter and just making sure that the beds are staying at the in the range that we want them to. Because um, like, like you mentioned, like Justin doesn't have any way of having runoff in his beds. He literally has a little tiny, like, <laughs> I mean, it's not much larger than a solo cup, little bucket hanging off the side of the beds because the way his facility was designed, it was, you know, it was an old right, chicken factory. <laughs> so he kind of had to modify it and there's no drains in the room. So, uh, yeah, and, and they've had a couple floods, but overall it's been, it's been really, really positive um, and worked really well for him. So, yeah, I don't know. I just thought, I just thought it'd be fun to have a little discussion around it. Um, the only yeah. other thing I really wanted to touch on with you is uh, you run bare soil. You don't have cover crops in there. Um, explain. I mean, I've, I know I've been pretty vocal about my thoughts on it, but what, what are your thoughts around running a cover crop? Yeah, I mean, most of my thoughts are probably from taking advice from you because, um, you know, as far as like learning how to grow in these large beds of living soil, like you've been the person that I've talked to the most. So, in general, like I remember I was really excited about doing some cover crops um, after I got the beds and, you know, your, your advice was, you know, you can harbor additional pests and stuff like that. And, you know, Suzanne's always told me the same thing. And I've always had, since I went to the beds, I've had great results with doing amendments the way I'm doing them. So I guess my thought is a little bit, you know, along the lines of like, if it isn't broke, don't fix it sort of thing is, you know, the results, we're getting results that we're quite satisfied with. And it is an additional thing that you would have to manage. Um, and, you know, I've done some reading on cover crops. And, you know, in indoors, I'm not sure that everybody's getting the, the nitrogen cycling that they that they want. And I, I don't really know, like, it's just one of these things that I've never, I've never done that. Um, and I, I, I can't remember, but I, I was reading something about somebody talking about doing cover crops um, and how much nitrogen actually makes it back into the soil through those crops. And um, I think it's a lot less than, than our people are hoping for sometimes. And it is, it's, it's another, it's another environment that you're trying to manage. So 
you know, so for you me, it's something I just haven't, I just haven't gotten into really. Okay. I thought, I didn't know if you'd played around with it. Um, I know Goldleaf did and moved away from it. Um, I wasn't sure if that was something you would ever. No, I, 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 at one point I was all, I was all jazzed up to give it a whirl and, um, oh, and then I ruined I it for know, you. I think <laughs> uh, you weren't the only one. I mean, I talked to a few people and you know, it is one of those things. It's like, if you, if things are going well, um, you know, doesn't always make sense to start trying new things. Um, so I, I still have a curiosity about it, honestly. Uh, but yeah, well, if folks yeah, want to hear maybe, my maybe thoughts. I'll try it someday. Maybe I'll try it again. Maybe I'll give it a, a give the thought process a, a chance again. Now that you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a black and white answer, but I I I, I definitely fall on the side of, of not using cover crops indoors. And if people want to read more yeah. about that, I have a blog post that's fairly recent up there on why mm -hmm. uh at least so people can read my logic and and then tell me i'm wrong i get that a fair bit but um yeah <laughs> I, I guess philosophically too it, it sort of made sense to me too because it is one more variable and you know I, I was talking with somebody the other night and i was talking about you know like this organic growing process it really has so many variables just like um you were saying earlier is that like this really is a puzzle that i'm really still working on and you know, yeah, like adding this thing in or not is it, like if 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 I was going to try it, I want to test it. Like, am I going to bring this in or not? And I'm still messing with a lot of other things at this point, so I'm always kind of testing this and that. And um, you know, maybe I'll get there someday. And it just hasn't made it to the forefront of of what I've tested. Yeah, and when you say testing, uh, you you brought up a good point. You're not just uh... You're not just doing something across your entire facility when you say tests. It's it's no. uh, that's not that's not what you mean. Right. Yep. I always kind of if I'm trying out something new, I, I bring it in in a depending on my level of confidence. If it's if I'm skeptical, I do it on a very small area, and if I'm you know more confident, I might try it on a broader area, like the micronutrients. Like I wasn't worried that I was going to ruin the soil in half of the beds because I didn't you know I didn't even go for the targets. I went for like half of the targets and waited for analysis, so I'm kind of creeping up on it. Um, but yeah, I always sort of like try something and see if it starts making sense and then kind of scale up on it, you know. Actually, Ben Higgins, the one you did with him, I had my people listen to it. I was like, you know, I was sending the link to my employees, like, you guys got to listen to this. This is like, you know, this is how I think and this is how I want you guys to think his process of, you know, basically bringing in the scientific process into the into cultivation it's definitely like how my brain works and to have someone like really talk about it the way he did was like really clearly so mm -hmm. um you know i have the same mindset I, I do a lot of um you know if i if i have a hypothesis on, on how something might be better or uh, you know to get rid of a problem i i come up with an idea on how i'm going to test that thing and then prove it out awesome yeah and i like the idea that you started with half of your what you thought might be your target just to make sure you weren't overdoing it because you can always add more and and a lot of people i think yeah a little carried away on that side of things so that's and that's i and i advice. have found um yeah on the micronutrients like the copper um when i've added that it's basically just stayed and that's one of the things that's given me some out some confidence in analysis is, is i can see that copper in the beds that i've added it to in a way that really does make sense hmm. um and then the other ones like manganese like i've added manganese and it just it disappears um, so that's when I can see that the plants are actually uptaking that manganese, whereas the copper sort of just stays in that bed. So if you add too much copper, like you're probably screwed. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a, but I've seen manganese really, I don't know if it's leaching out, like if we're having some runoff or if the plants are uptaking it, but I suspect the plants are actually uptaking it because we had in those older beds, there was virtually no manganese. Yeah. I'd be a little cautious with it because I think, um, it was Sam Hofler. Uh, from Proof, who did some experimentation, and, and he does tissue testing along with um, uh, the soil testing, and he does it on a whole other level. Mm. No, one, no one's doing as many tests as he is, uh, and, <laughs> and, and graphing them and, and figuring out what each analyte is is, is really amazing. Um, yeah. what, what he's doing is really state of the art. I got to he gave me a quick little tour uh, video shot of, of what he does, and one of the things they found was that when they were adding manganese they actually started to see some toxicities they got in trouble with it because it was being taken up um so dramatically by the plant so um 
it, it would well, be I'll keep an eye on that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just watch that and be careful because, um, the, you know, tissue testing is really how we figure out what's actually making it into the plants. Um, the soil testing, we're just making mm -hmm. assumptions that, you know, the amount of biology that we have, yeah. these nutrients are coming available. Um, whereas the tissue testing is a little more accurate in that regard, but I actually don't do a ton of tissue testing, but that one I did, um, and that's one of the reasons that I was really convinced to go after the micronutrients too, because in the tissue testing, um, they were basically non-detectable. It was like three or four, maybe five micronutrients that were just like, and, and I don't know, like they give you these reference ranges and it's like, okay, like how much are you supposed to have in there? And, um, but there was a few that was like, okay, no matter what the reference range is, this is like non-detectable levels here. Um, so, and manganese was one of them. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, mm. I know we've been chatting for a while. Is there any last, you know, advice, uh, whether on the business side or on the cultivation side, um, that you'd like to share with folks? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, the, one of the, yeah, I mean, just be, just be ready for some failures. <laughs> um, you know, even just like about a month ago, um, one of my employees said to me, you know, it's a good thing I have a, I think what he said, he goes, it's a good thing you have a really healthy relationship with failure. Um, you know, we were redoing some of the drainage system in a couple of the beds and, um, you know, there was a clog and so <laughs> the beds just filled up with water. Luckily there weren't any plants in them at the time. We were doing a little bit of a flush to get some sodium and chloride right. down. And, um, you know, so we had to basically like, excavate these beds and it was just like this soup uh, and this whole thing, we had spent a week taking out these three yards of soil from these two different beds, putting in this, you know, drainage pipe and all this to try to be able to collect the water in one location. And we refilled everything. And then we had to basically take it all apart again. And, and it was a mess. And, um, you know, stuff like that just happens all the time to everybody. So it's like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's there's just a lot of failure involved in it. And there's a lot of, you know, you think something's going to it doesn't or you didn't even know something was going to bite you and then it does um so it's just a lot of a lot of resilience and in, in knowing that like you know just because something goes wrong it's probably gone wrong for everybody else too so if you can you know muster the energy to try to figure it out and call some people you can usually get through it if you just uh, like decide i'm going to solve this i'm going to get through this and um you know that's one thing that's been really tough about being a small business owner it's not always, it's not even always cultivation you know, packaging shipments, it's the whole thing, you know? Um, so just, you know, have a healthy relationship with failure. Yeah. I think you've done a good job of creating a sort of a community around you of, of resources and then also, um, building a good brand to where, you know, consumers know what, what to expect when they walk in the store and see, you know, Minecraft cannabis and, uh, you know, generating that interest on the brand side, I think is, is equally as important as growing a high quality product. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to give my wife, Emily credit for all of that. You know, um, when Absolutely. we were first getting going with all that, she really, she's pushed me a lot to, you know, share stuff on Instagram and even to do podcasts like this, like, you know, this isn't my comfort zone. You probably know that too, but, um, you know, it's always, for me, it's always been, I'm, I'm willing to do it because it, the, the former me would still like to hear what the current me has to say, even though I don't know everything. Um, and then that transparency has really, you know, I think it's built a lot of um, trust in, in our industry with our brand and it's really paid off. And Emily's the one who's pushed me to do that because no one really wants to make a video about their AFID problems. Um, but, you know, the me who was newer would have been so happy to find the video of the current me with my aphid problem saying how I solved it, even if it's not exactly what I'm going to do. So, um, you know, th that, the, the work she's done on creating the brand is, yeah, it's, it's especially the way the market is going in Maine right now, like having, having people that can identify your product is, is really paid off, um, quite a bit. And, and that's really through the, uh, communication she's forced me to make <laughs> and her own communication through it as well, obviously. Yeah. I know she's gotten really into the chocolate 
side of things too and, and using you know premium ingredients and processes to make a really high quality product for consumers yeah yeah i mean so, our, our goal in general is to try to whenever we do something to do it the best we can so we don't have like a really wide product line we kind of have figured the things that we make really well and um that we can specialize in and then we just sort of focus on that and that's you know, definitely something Emily's brought to the table as well. I'm usually more quick to be like, hey, we should get into this product. This looks really fun. Other people are doing this. Um, and, you know, she'll try to refocus me and be like, we don't need to do everything. Just, you know, let's pick the things that we can do well and just nail those, which makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time today. And I appreciate you doing this. And kudos to Emily for uh, <laughs> forcing you on the show. So, <laughs> um, Okay, Dad. I really right. appreciate it, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Bye. That was Mike Wilson, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.